Thank you so much, Piero. Uh, we, Piero, I met in Austria, actually, uh, when we were at a conference together in Obach, which was near Innsbruck. And, uh, and then we've stayed in touch since then. Uh, so I only recently graduated from Stanford, but now I'm a guest lecturer there uh, in a new initiative called Sustainable Urban Systems, which is this idea of a new uh, actual a kind of urban planning program, because Stanford doesn't have one right now, but they want to house it within the School of Engineering. And I love that, that I'm following uh, Professor Horn, because it's exactly that topic of messes. And you can think of all big cities in the world as humongous messes. Um, our view is, is actually taken directly from that concept of wicked problems. Uh, we have our students read that text as one of the very first things. And our take on wicked problems is to really try to develop a science-based urban planning uh, modeling different systems, whether they're physical infrastructures all the way down to the social, political, and economic structures. And then to really map flows of capital, whether that's ecological resources like energy and water, or on the downstream side, the wastes and pollutants. But it's not just the ecological flows, it's the economic flows of capital, it's human and social capital. And those are the hard ones to really map because we don't even know enough social science, I think, to understand all the interrelated problems like you mentioned uh, in, in cities. And uh, luckily, the project I want to show you guys is sort of a combination of thinking about wicked problems in cities. And unfortunately, I missed the, the previous presentation, but it seems like a similar type of urban project. So I think this is a really nice merger of the two. Uh, just my background. So I studied architecture and civil engineering, just finished my structural engineering degree. Um, I have my own practice called Cloud Arc Studio uh, that we do design, urban design related projects, and I teach uh, this class I described at Stanford, and I also teach at a high school called the Nueva Upper School in San Mateo, and I teach architecture there. Did you work on the De Maxion house no. at Stanford? The De Maxion, the Decathlon house? Yeah, the Decathlon Yes, house. yes, the so Solar Decathlon uh, is a U.S. Department of Energy sponsored competition every two years, and they have 20 collegiate teams design and build solar powered houses, and we did one in 2013. Sales project manager. So the sort of aspect of wicked problems I wanted to talk about is this phenomenon uh, called the tragedy of the commons. And hopefully you guys have heard that phrase before, but it came from um, a text. This was probably a, um, uh, by a, a, theor a planning theorist or, or maybe even a biologist, but this idea of shared resources. And as, you, as soon as you begin to privatize shared resources or you have your own set of sheep that you want to uh, uh, allow to eat grass or, or, or poop in the grass, then you start to think of the, the commons as something you don't have to worry as much about because everyone's kind of sharing in the costs and benefits of what you do to the, to the environment. And of course, the, the sort of spiral effect of the tragedy of the commons is that we lose our shared natural resources. So we think about this a lot in the context of climate change. Um, but I've recently started to think about it a lot in terms of cities. And you can almost directly translate that to public space. Uh, cities, before they're cities, they're, it's entirely public space. And we start to eat into that with private buildings, with single family homes and suburban sprawl. And, and as we can find in San Francisco, even in a grand place like Market Street, it's slowly and slowly getting eaten away, uh, sometimes literally, with, uh, with private establishments, with indoor shopping malls, the kinds of places that certain disadvantaged communities might not feel as comfortable going into. But I think. The, the, the biggest aspect is more intangible. It's a kind of social construct of gentrification and, and creating parts of, the, uh, of public space that are incredibly socially divided. So what happened was um, I had the opportunity with my uh, practice to participate in the San Francisco project. Uh, it's sponsored by the planning department and the Grupo Buena Center for the Arts. And they wanted to prototype uh, new ways of introducing social engagement on Market Street. I think this is for the hopes of, in 2018, incorporating a couple new installations onto Market Street as part of their big repaving project. Uh, I've, I've even heard that in the future they want Market Street to be an entirely pedestrian uh, street. So what they did is, in April of this year, they invited 50 artists and, and designers to submit uh, proposals, and they selected 50. And they were all down Market Street in, in five different districts. Uh, we were selected to be in Embarcadero, um, and if you just sort of mentally imagine what Embarcadero looks like, it's right next to the Hyatt, it's, you can see the ferry building right there, and it's a really touristy and, and, and well put together part of Market Street. So we came up with the design, we had a small amount of space we could use, 12 feet by 12 feet, and I was really interested in this tragedy of the commons idea, and, and one way I think about messes is that are there lubricants or, or certain types of compounds that can help 
un unentangle those messes. And I think that you know we've lost an incredible amount of social capital uh, in the U.S. since since the 50s, and uh, part of that may be the suburbanization and this. Uh, loss of community groups, of civic engagement, of volunteering and altruism. And we see that on our streets when people don't even engage with each other anymore, are always looking on their phones, <coughs> try to ignore the homeless people on the street, and, and, and we have this huge social inequity now, uh, which just leads to conflicts. And I wanted to just create a simple design installation that would increase that social engagement, get people to actually notice each other again. And it's essentially a game in which you have uh, a grid like this, and these, the stepping patterns right here and the seats are activated sensor panels. So when you step on them, it activates a 12-volt uh, uh, circuit that will basically take that signal to, some, to do something. And the way we programmed it is that it's linked to these surprise fountains that are inside the landscape. And the game is that you need both uh, the seat and its corresponding steps to both be activated at the same time for something to happen. If just one person sitting here, nothing happens. If somebody bikes or walks by, nothing happens. But when you get a link, then, then that surprise happens. And it's sort of coordinated with uh, the two steps correspond to these two planters here. So that's the effect we wanted to create. No signs at all. This would just be a, a sort of surprise when people discovered it. And we just, it was really a social experiment to see what would happen. This is a render of what it would look like um, on that part of Market Street uh, with reclaimed redwood. That's uh, something we use in the Solar House project, actually. And so I have just a couple of videos um, showing the design process. You know, we have, we're a very small team of uh, just a, a bunch of students I've worked well with uh, at Stanford, and we uh, just prototyped and, and put together a very simple system. So the only science besides the social theory is, is a 12-volt uh, limit switch and a couple of Arduinos. So I don't know how scientific this, this really gets. Um, but we uh, put it together. We used... Um, outlets and, and water pumps to create the fountain system. This was uh, just a, before we built the real thing, we wanted to test to make sure the interaction actually worked. This is kind of a fundamental element of user experience that you want to be able to prototype it before you build the real thing. And so here we are, the very first time, trying to test the panels, which were these little foam <laughs> strips that would activate the limit switches, but they didn't always work. Um, so there's us just, this is literally the, the first 10 minutes of us testing and, and realizing that our mechanical engineering didn't interface perfectly well with the electrical engineering, didn't interface well with the architecture. But by the end of that day, we felt like you know, there was something magical about the system we'd set up and, and we felt pretty good about moving forward with the real thing. So then we started building the real thing, um, really just two by two, two by four construction. Uh, pretty much everything can be bought at Home Depot, so it was really a low tech, low budget operation for us. Um, but with a little bit of um, our arts and architecture background too, we de definitely wanted to use uh, this reclaimed, uh, recycled wood uh, just for a really nice finish um, at the end of it all. So that's um, the process. And then the secret are these Home Depot buckets underneath the planters uh, that were just, it was only a three day festival, so we could just let it recirculate uh, with water inside the, uh, the buckets. And then we varied the different heights to, to give it some, some uh, dynamic uh, appearance. This was the control box after the prototyping situations. We, we put it together like this and it's hidden underneath the seats. This is us putting it, uh, taking it from Palo Alto to San Francisco the night of, uh, putting it together. And then the morning we went and grabbed a bunch of plants from Osh and, and just threw them in just to give it a little life. Uh, at the end of the day. So that's what it looked like pretty much the first day that we had it up. This was April 9th through 11th of this year. And uh, we just sort of <coughs> waited to see what would happen. And so this is sort of what started to happen. Uh, people would really, a lot of people would walk by, have no idea what's going on, and they just sort of shrug and then keep walking. Some people would walk, step on it, it didn't work because they didn't know the secret, they'd shrug and walk away. But then as soon as you got that link, it was viral. Because then suddenly people would see the water from maybe 50 feet away and they'd say, whoa, what was that? And then they'd come over and they'd try to step on it, but then it wouldn't work because they didn't know the secret. They didn't know you have to do it with somebody across from you. And then, once people did start to do that, <laughs> And the, 
there was one moment, sort of after the first few hours of it happening, and, and I remember I was just sitting there enjoying the, how well it was working. And then just in the distance, I noticed somebody had fallen on the ground. Um, she was looking at some of the the uh, uh, the jewelry that was being sold on the street, and she had essentially like a seizure or a concussion. She fell on the ground. I heard a smack on the back of her head, and everyone here rushed over to help. And I think that is just an example of what happens when you start to notice what's going on around you. And, and the ambulance came, somebody called 911, somebody had her head, somebody was grabbing her things, and, and that to me was, of course it wasn't the reason that, that she got help, but it, it really uh, made it clear in my mind well, how much this matters. So at the very end of the festival we decided, we because we were still in experimenting mode, uh, we ended up taking all the fountains out and then putting lights, because really the feature can be anything you want. It can be light, water, sound, kinematics. Uh, and so we just, the last few hours of its existence uh, on this part of the street, we put lights in and it was, again, a, a very different type of thing. People suddenly started to stand here because it became like a dance scene. And I got really interested in this movie. And this was really an unexpected way they were playing with it. But I liked that it was really fueling that level of interaction, this kind of fury. So I'll, I'll touch on that later. But uh, that was the end of that. Uh, they liked our uh, installation. The, the public liked it. The jury liked it. And they invited us back for another one, which was actually this past month on a different part of Market Street. They brought only five of them back, uh, along with some other installations. And now, do a mental image of where this part of Market Street is. Quite different. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I had known about it. I actually live on 9th and Market, so I'm pretty close by. Um, and right away we knew that we, first of all, we had recycled the other one so we couldn't bring it back, so we wanted to design a new one. We had a lot of new ideas we wanted to test. But just knowing that this was a much different part of Market Street, I, I changed up the aesthetics a lot as well. So this is um, just an animation of, of what we did. We still had the fountain piece, but then we added this wall structure, which you'll see more of. Um, it was direct response to that light show that, that we noticed happening. Um, and this was sort of the, the new version we had. We wanted to put much brighter colors to be clearer about that, um, the interaction. Um, but otherwise, we kept the plywood largely unfinished. We didn't have the money anymore for the reclaimed redwood, but we thought it worked well in this part of the neighborhood. So this is what it looked like uh, when we put it together. This was the end of September of this year. And so you can see that you know, this was essentially the same thing as before, but a little simple, and then we have this piece. So this is kind of like Battleship where if you step on that blue one, and then you're, someone else is stepping on that one, the top frame will light up with an LED frame. So it's kind of a mirrored effect. And if you both step forward one, then the one below will, will light up. And uh, put it together, and then this was the, mm. I think the first day or so it happened. So the first thing we didn't realize was that right in front of our installation is a liquor store, and then a smoke shop, and essentially, it's the drug dealing capital of San Francisco right there. Um, and of course, the, the typical clientele there swarmed into this and pretty much occupied it 24 7. From my point of view, it was a huge success. I mean, we had this kind of thing happening. I'll just go through some this is what it would look like on a normal day. Um, I, I believe benches used to exist on Market Street, and so when, when we even just put four seats, it was always occupied, always used. So they're not lying on the sidewalk? Yes. Uh, this was the first, this was a kickoff event. Um, kids that would otherwise just be sitting there with their parents were, were playing on this. This was like, this is kind of light effect. The dog was not heavy enough to make it work. misinteraction. Uh, and, I, and I end with this video because uh, unfortunately the story dramatically changes from this point because uh, what happened is the city uh, got very scared about what was happening with this installation. Uh, they, were, they were getting complaints about this kind of thing, about arrests being made. In a, arrests that would have been made anyway because people are dealing drugs here, there, there's prostitution happening around this part of the street. But because it was associated with this, with this installation, the city didn't like that. They didn't like that there was this association with criminal activity and their Market Street prototyping festival. So they asked me to move it. 
They asked me to just get rid of it. We, we can actually move it 100 feet down the street uh, to, to a better part of the block and it'd be fine. I really pushed against that because I thought the whole point of doing this, uh, this kind of work is to start to bridge the divide between the tragedy of the commons. To try to realize the shared public space we have and that opportunity to reconnect with each other. And they just didn't like the potential risk of a, of a bad event happening on there. This was a meeting that, that I basically helped to uh, organize. These are people from the planning department, YBCA, uh, different artists that also participated. And uh, I tried to present my case that this was something worth keeping there um, as opposed to moving. And unfortunately, uh, at the end of it all, they did have us move it a week and a half early, as if keeping it another week and a half would have been a catastrophe uh, to the street. Um, but they did it sort of for the bureaucracy purposes. So this was us the day we had to move it. People were flabbergasted that it was being moved. They even helped us clean up uh, as, as we were putting it, taking it apart. And so this is where it was. We moved it halfway through October. And then the, did uh, the you festival replace ended. it or did you just take it away? They just had us move it. They said, we don't want to deal with this problem. Those, they didn't want anywhere yeah. on Mars. They didn't want anywhere on Mars. Mm -hmm. Because I would have argued that they should have compensated us for the move, and they said, well, their, their job is to move it at the end of the festival anyway, so let's just move that ahead of schedule. And no, no problem for us. So that was the uh, conclusion of, of that second phase. Now, the good thing is they invited us for round three, which is actually going to be October of 2016. They're going to have the whole big festival again, but they have 10 projects, the best projects from the first round as kind of incubated projects, and these are ones that might even stay for up to 24 months on the street. No word yet on the actual location, uh, but I will fight to, to be back here and maybe uh, uh, sort of next version of this will be in multiple places on Market Street. Um, but for me, as a this is just out of school, my first experience doing real design projects and fortunately doing public design projects in which uh, I had a sense that the bureaucracy would be the biggest challenge, not the, not the design challenge. Um, but it has shown me at least the type of design that I really care about, which is um, public design that has the power to build empathy between people, uh, the design that has the power to activate social space. Uh, and I see it in the context of the work I'm doing at Stanford, talking with students about these big, wicked problems in cities. And this is just a small piece, but I think that every single moment that can happen on a street that gets people to care about each other is a little bit of that lubricant that can untangle our problems. Um, so I'd love to talk more about what because we haven't actually designed version 3 yet, so if you have any ideas on what the feature should look like or where it should be, I'm very happy to talk about that. I'm also happy to talk about the work I'm doing at Stanford. Uh, so that is it.